children and can go to um, the nursery, Sunday school, those who wish to go. And I welcome you to the house of the Lord again. Um, there is an announcement that I forgot this morning. Um, that if you are joining us in person, there is an Easter lunch. So if you are able to stay, we welcome you to come and partake of lunch. And we bless you if you need to leave, but you'll be blessed without lunch. So uh, we hope that you can stay uh, for lunch. Anyway, if, if you are able, I understand we're all busy and we have family and all that kind of stuff. But if you're able to stay, I pray that you will be able to partake with us. So welcome to New Creation. Everybody in person and all of you online. If you're online, I'm sorry to confess, but you, you've missed out. It's been wonderful worshiping this morning. So, um, God is so good. Before we get into the Word, let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to minister the Word to us. So wherever you are joining us online, also just, just bow your head at, at this moment. Father, we just come before you. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for that good news that rang out loud and clear on this blessed day. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would be among us. Help us to understand it, to receive it. Holy Spirit, anoint our ears. Give us all ears to hear what you are saying to us, that we don't miss it. Holy Spirit, anoint our minds that we might understand it and grasp it to understand what you are saying to us. The Holy Spirit, you would anoint our hearts, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers also, that we would be transformed by your word. Lord, only you can do this, and only by the power of your spirit. <coughs> Finally, Holy Spirit, we pray you would anoint me and the words, Lord, that I would be able to speak your word as I ought, and give you all glory, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, I'm kind of continuing from Good Friday. And I shared on Good Friday that when I was about 15, I'd come to know the Lord at a young age. And I had no idea what the Lord did for me. But I believed on Him absolutely. I, I remember at the age of 15, standing at the edge of the woods, looking out over a pond with some ducks and stuff, because I liked watching, I still enjoy watching ducks and geese and that kind of thing. And I remember it was Easter Sunday, I'm pretty sure it was Sunday, not Good Friday, but on that Sunday, I, I remember crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, I believe you. I believe in you. I believe that you... You gave yourself upon the cross, that you died on the cross, and that three days later, you rose again. I believe you. I know the historical event, but I don't know what it means for me. I believe in you absolutely, but I, I don't, Lord, understand what, how th does that apply to me now? Standing 2,000 years later, looking back at history, what does this mean? See, I had, I had two interests in, in, in those days. Um, I still have them now, but um, love nature and I love history. And so I was that day enjoying uh, nature with the ducks and the geese and the birds and all that good stuff. Um, and I loved ancient history. I loved reading everything I could find on ancient history. Um, so I knew and believed in the historical event of Jesus of Nazareth being led to a cross, dying and rising again. I believe, and I believed on Jesus, absolutely, but I had no idea what does this mean for me. I knew the historical events, I knew that on the day Christ was crucified, so many things happened. Jesus had said on Palm Sunday, um, as children ran out, crying, Hosanna in the highest of the Son of David. They sang his praises and, and people held palm branches and put down their cloaks for the Lord to ride into the city of Jerusalem. And the Pharisees got really upset about it and, and they said, make them stop. Do, do you not hear what they're saying? Make them be quiet. 
And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if they did not cry out, the rocks themselves would shout. The rocks themselves would bear witness. Everything was bearing witness on, on that day. All of creation was holding its breath almost. There was this burst of excitement and creation would go on to hold its breath at that moment. I knew the events that took place on the crucifixion. I knew that on that day, all of creation had to respond to, to the events of Good Friday. That as this innocent man was crucified, the sun, S-U-N, could not shine its light upon what we were doing to the sun, S-O-N. That the earth went dark, and, and scientists are baffled by this. We have no idea how there could be a solar eclipse in the middle of the day, because what causes a solar eclipse is, is, is the moon getting in the way of the sun and all this kind of stuff. But in the middle of the day, they don't line up, which is why solar eclipses tend to happen either about 9 a.m. or 3 p.m., when they're kind of in the, in the orbits. And I have to spin my fingers around to try to you know, um, explain that. But... We have no idea how the sun went dark, but it did go dark. On that day, the sun could not bear to look upon the earth of what man had done to Jesus. The rocks themselves on that day did cry out. It says that the rocks were torn asunder in the Gospel of Matthew. That the rocks tore open and there was a violent earthquake. And that earthquake was felt over the entire ancient world. It was not just Matthew who recorded it. Josephus who did not, was not a Christian, a Jewish historian of that day wrote about the earthquake in his history of Jerusalem, writing only some 30 years later, wrote of that earthquake because it rocked the entire ancient world. Tacitus, another Roman historian, writing from what is now Turkey, also wrote of that earthquake. It was felt in Rome, the entire ancient world was shaken. The whole globe <coughs> shuddered at what had just taken place. And the rocks did cry out that this is the very Son of God. Mm -hmm. That death lost its power at that moment. Death lost its grip. We've all heard the expression, get a grip. Death lost its grip in that moment. It says that the graves were opened and many of the old saints came out and were seen of many. Death could not hold on in shock of what, at the one who, had, who was entering death. Death could not hold on to its captives as it was getting ready to receive the one who was hanging upon the tree. Death could not hold on. The dead walked on that day and were seen and testified of the one uh, by many witnesses. The temple itself, the very, the holy of holies, the holiest place in the only people on earth who knew God Almighty from a long way off, but they still knew him a little bit. The Jewish people, the most holy place, the place that only the high priest go in, and he could only go in there once a year with blood to offer the blood on the Day of Atonement, to sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. And if he did it wrong, just in case he had a rope and little bells tied around his waist, so that if the bells stopped ringing, the, the, the rope would be pulled to pull his dead body out of there. No one could look in it. Nobody could enter it. It was the place where God himself dwelled. The, the Bible tells us how sin separates us from God. And so there was a separation made in the most holy place, to keep the most holy place from the holy place, so that we would not look in there and die. And on that day, the, the veil was torn from top to bottom, and man saw into the most holy place. There was now nothing separating us as the body of our Lord was hanging upon a tree. And I knew, I knew all of this historically as events. I knew them and I believed in them. But I had no idea what it meant for me. I, I did not know what it meant for me. I knew that on the third day at the break of dawn, the disciples went, the, the, the ladies had, had gathered up spices
it was a lot of spices, about 70 pounds of spices to embalm his body. So, so these were, were, you know, they were serious about this. This was heavy stuff. <laughs> they were, they were, were getting out early in the morning to embalm the body who was hastily buried in a rich man's tomb, in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And when they got there, they found the stone was rolled away, angels standing there, who, at whose appearance, by the way, the earth shook again, blinding light shone out from them, and the Roman guards, who were very good at standing up against enemies, these guys were, were trained professionals. They fell as dead men in the presence of the glory of the Lord in these angels. And the angel said, He is not here. He is risen. Why do you look? Why do you look for him amongst the dead? He is, he is not dead. He is alive. This news is so powerful and, and I believed in it. And I, and I believe it now more than ever. I don't want to say just past tense. But speaking from that moment, 15-year-old me, I believed it, but I didn't know what it meant for me. I didn't know, Lord, what does this have to do with me? This happened 2,000 years ago. You know, some uh, groups hold uh, a memorial service. Hmm. You only hold a memorial service for somebody who's dead. You don't hold memorial services for somebody who's alive. Because, you know, they're going to totally crash the memorial service by being present in the midst of it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing disrupts a funeral more than, than, than the guy walking in. If you're um, so, you know. Um, but you see, I didn't understand that then. So I, I would like you to turn in your Bibles, and I'm going to get into it uh, more. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 53. I'm going to read all of the passage. Because it's important, all of it. I also grew up mostly with the Old Testament and not very much with the New Testament. I hardly ever read the New Testament. But I read all of the Old Testament, but hardly knew the New Testament. So that's why we're going to read from the Old Testament. Because it testified of him. Jesus quoting Psalm 40 would say, Behold, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. That all of this testified of the Messiah. What he would do among us. So Isaiah 53, the whole chapter. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form, nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I read that. We heard that on Good Friday. But now from verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was caught off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, 
He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. See, there, there are some small words. Short words are easy to remember. There are some short words that are extremely powerful. They are short, but very powerful. He was wounded for our transgressions. Our is a very short word. It's only three letters. He was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquities is a long word, but our is a very short word. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Again, there is our. And we, that's an even shorter word. But it is incredibly powerful. By his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our, we, us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Oh, Papa. See, I did not realize at that time that I was included in the our and the we and the us. That my name was in there, in, in those little short words. That he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, I am healed. I didn't realize that on Good Friday, it was for me that he went to the cross. It was not a, a mere historical event. That The Bible was not interested in recording something as history, but recording something as a continuing reality. That, that this thing, that, that, that this event that rocked the whole world, literally, in every sense of the word, every sense that anything could be shaken, it was shook. But this event was an ongoing reality. By his stripes, we are healed. I am healed. You are healed. By his stripes, by his wounds, our transgressions are forgiven. By his bruising, our iniquities can be cleansed. That the chastisement of our peace was upon him. I didn't know that then, that I was included in this. And the reason why I can be included is because it doesn't end there. Now we know that, but we, I, I just sometimes wonder how much do we know that. We know it, but we don't know it. Many of us, I'm, I'm sharing this because I don't believe I'm the only one there, or was the only one there. That this passage of scripture does not end there. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That we all probably know the pas passage of both Luke 3 and Matthew 3 in which Jesus was baptized. He was baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And as he came out of the water and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descended upon him, there was a voice heard from heaven that spoke over him, saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am infuriated. I don't know what version that is. That's, I am well pleased. I am well pleased with my son. Forgive me, I, I don't want to be irreverent, but I do want you to get this. I dearly, desperately want you to get this. That the father is well pleased with the son. He said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Um, there are two 
times in the Old Testament, two situations in which a person would be anointed. They'd be anointed to reign as a king. They'd be a sacrifice would be anointed to die. And the dead body would be anointed. The anointing was for reigning, ruling, and death hmm. as a sacrifice. And it says the Holy Spirit came upon him. The anointing is a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's not in the oil. I, I heard you know, someone had to anoint someone, and, and, and this fellow was an elder in the church, but he was also a mechanic. So, and, and he was a bachelor at the so he also didn't have any real good cooking oil, so he used motor oil to anoint. It's not in the kind of oil, so just thank God you don't have to be like that. <laughs> You're a, a motor oil, um, but it's not the oil. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and the Father bore witness over the Son as the Holy Spirit came upon him and remained on him, rested upon him, filled him, saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. That the Father was anointing the Son to be the sacrifice and to reign as King. That, that the prophet Isaiah, I mean, this passage was written almost 700 years before any of this came to be. But the prophet Isaiah said, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That the Father saying, this is my good pleasure, to see my son carry that cross to that hilltop. This is my pleasure, that he will be the sacrifice, that he will be the king whom I have chosen. That this is my good pleasure, that through him I will bring many sons to glory. Through him I will bring a people to myself, all people, of all tongues, of all tribes, of all nations. That the way will be made open. This was my pleasure. We thought he was stricken of God and afflicted. We thought it must be God. What were the words that the mockers said looking at the cross? They said, well, he trusted in God. Let God bring him down. We thought he was stricken of God, we didn't realize that this was the whole purpose of God, that this was the pleasure of God, that uh, again, not very long before the crucifixion, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of a high mountain, and he was transfigured before their eyes, he was, they were allowed to see him in his glory. And he appeared with Moses and Elijah speaking to them. And a voice was heard from heaven saying again, This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Because again the father is declaring, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And because I am well pleased in what he shall do, he shall see of the travail of his soul. Of he shall, see, in other words, to put that in our modern English, he will see the outcome of what he has done. He shall see the results, and the results would have names like Paula and Lorraine and Clarice and Chris and Judy, the people who would be ransomed by his own shed blood, the people who could receive his peace because he was chastised for it. The people who could receive his healing because his stripes paid for it. He would see of the travail of his soul. He would see his seed. He would prolong his days. That he would see what he has accomplished by his own cross. That he would not be allowed to see corruption. But that he would give his soul as an offering for sin. At that time, I only knew that as history, an historical event. I believed in it. I believed in Jesus as my Savior. But I had no idea what it meant for me. Now I know. I know that we can pray for someone and expect them to be healed. Because it's been paid for. The cost has already been counted. 
I know that demons have to leave in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus has taken the keys of death and hell by giving his soul as an offering for sin. I know that the worst sinner can find grace at his feet. Because he took their sin for them. For me. Paul, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But I know that the worst of sinners can find a place at his table, can find a place in his presence, because it's been paid for. And not only that it's been paid for, but that he lives to ensure that it happens. He said, this cup is the New Testament covenant in my blood. And in the cutting of this new covenant, in the formation of this new covenant, it would allow all of us to come, that the way is open. And that not only would he die to make this covenant, but he would live to enforce it. Live to see that it take place. What I did not know in short was that at that time, and, and now I do, I only know it a little bit. Just enough to speak it to you. Just enough to believe on it. I, I, I don't know the half of it. This is something that, that is too wonderful for me. But I do know the way has been made. That Jesus died for you and he died for me. And not only that, but he lives for you. And he lives for me. Mm -hmm. That we have all hope, all life, all joy. Because of a simple phrase, he is risen. Amen. The cost has been paid. It's not an historical event, it is a continuing reality. A continuing, ongoing, experiential reality. And the Lord invites everyone to come into this reality. Jesus had even said, it is good for you that I go away. For I go, if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. But I will go to the Father, and He will send the Holy Spirit in my name. And the Holy Spirit, when He has come, will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Declaring the death and the resurrection of Christ. Declaring that the price has been paid and the judgment has been declared on the prince of this world. And the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh, as said by the prophet Joel. In those days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. There shall be dreams, there shall be visions, and all to the end. That whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Because the Lord would be revealed in the earth. And the glory of heaven would be seen in the earth, in his sacrifice, in his resurrection. Mm -hmm. If you have not entered into that, because this is not history, this is a continuing reality, because it lives for you, it lives for me. If you have not entered into this, I want to give you the invitation to enter in. If you have not entered into it before, if you do not know him, maybe you do know him, or you did know him at one time, but maybe life and the things of this world have pulled you away. Maybe there's a need for you to come back to him, to recommit your life to him. The Lord does not speak of tomorrow, he speaks of today. He says today, is the acceptable day. Now is the time. So if you want to come up for prayer, to receive Jesus as your Savior, or recommit your life to Him, now is the time. And today is the day. Because Jesus did not die and rise again just so that it could be history, but that we could all enter in to hold the door open for all of us. So I'm, I'm going to, if you want to come up, I'll invite you to come up for prayer. The way is open. And if you don't
want to come up for prayer, please, please, please do not put it off. You don't know what future holds. If anyone wants to come up, now is the time. us all to stand. And I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Pray with me right where you are. But I'd, I'd like you to bow your heads and, and pray in agreement in your own hearts. As we confess and believe and receive what the Lord has done for us on this blessed day. Father, right now we come before you in Jesus' name. In the name of him who loved us and died for us and rose for us. By whose stripes we are healed. By his blood we are forgiven. And by his life, we have everlasting life. Because death has no more power over him. In that he died once and for all. Father, right now we confess this. That Jesus is our Lord. I want you to repeat with me. Jesus, Jesus is, is my Lord. Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Savior. Lord Jesus, you live for me. Lord Jesus, you died for me, you live for me. Yes. My life is your life. Yes. Father, this is the great cost at which we were bought. Freely given to us, but at great cost. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for everyone that is here, everyone that is listening, that we would understand this to the, to the degree that we can. And that we might receive it in our own hearts, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we cannot on our own. But Father, you have made a way. In him who is the way and the truth and the life. Well, Father, we thank you for your indescribable gift. That through the blood of Jesus, we might know you. By his shed blood, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And all life is given. Father, I pray that your people, everyone that is here, Lord God, that we would receive that life and life abundantly that you died and lived for. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we bless you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. And amen. Lord bless you, we keep you, and he be gracious to you, cause his face to shine upon you. Amen. Amen.